All right, amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. He is good. How many been to the mountaintop? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, in some churches, they'd say, well, we done had a word from the Lord today, and so we can get ready to go. You ain't in one of them kind of churches. I can tell you that right now. We never substitute worship and praise for the word of God. Amen. Amen. But I will tell you this. 1.30, you'll be walking out the door unless you fellowship. Amen. I ain't even going to try to finish it today. Let me tell you why, because I ain't finished it this morning. And I want to start where I left off at the same place. So give me your next 40 minutes and we'll walk up out of here. I want to talk today. Now remember where we've been. We've been in this family month series. We started off talking about the bondage of freedom. Now it was for all of us, but specifically for our young people. If you got teenagers, they need that message. You ought to tell them to get it ready, pay for it, and they'll have it for you next week. Even got that one on DVD, so you can order the DVD. And then we talked about, uh, what we talk about next, Elder Green? <laughs> I'm just messing with you, Elder Green. Put you on. We, we, we talked about, yeah, when women deal with their issues. We looked at the woman with the issue of blood. Then we looked at when blind men see. Well, and we had two parts to that. And now we, uh, last week we talked about uh, the sanctity of marriage. Need to get that. If you head it toward the holy hills of matrimony, it is a rough climb. There's no cable cars that, that take you up. If you get up there, you got the climb. Amen. And so you need to get that now today in keeping with where we're going. What you say? That's right. In, in keeping where we're going, we're going to talk about why marriages fail. All right. Why marriages fail. So if you have your copy of the scriptures, I'm going to get some new water out of an old well. Turn to Judges chapter 14. We'll focus in on verses 1 and 2, verse 5, 15, and 20. We won't finish it all, but 1, 2, and 5 today. Why marriages fail. We've been picking on, and I picked on him. I probably preached about eight messages out of these three chapters on Samson already. And, and I haven't even scratched the surface. Judges chapter 14. Let's pray. We're not going to read the scripture today, fellas. Sorry. You may be seated. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Now speak to us before we know that you desire to do so. May we not hear the words of a preacher, but as it were, the words of the true and the living God. Help us to see that Pastor Ford is only the mailman, and the mail, the scriptures, have come from God. In his name we pray. Amen. The two most important decisions you're ever going to make in life are number one, who you're going to serve. And number two, who you're going to marry. See, the first one decides whether you'll have heaven or hell in the next life. The second one decides whether you're going to have heaven or hell in this life. Okay, well, you, 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 you'll get that. You'll, you'll get that later on. In other words, I said it just last week, remember? Marriage is like a screen door. Uh, the flies on the inside want to get out, and the flies on the outside want to get in. Now, guess what? You know, I'm, I'm, becoming, I'm, I'm becoming dangerous on this computer because I can Google now. <laughs> oh, hey. I can Google. And so I Google now. So I went in, I Googled in marriage, reasons for failure. And guess what? This is what a survey said. That, that, that seven out of ten people, when asked, would you marry that same person over again? Now, they've been married ten years or more. Would you marry that same person over again? Seven out of ten said no. Some of them put an adjective in front of no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like the wife who said to her husband, oh, what's wrong? You used to say you could eat me up. He said, baby, I lost my appetite. 
One woman said, you know, I thought when I met him that he came down from heaven and that he was a gift of God. But after I married him, I found out he came from the other direction, was sent by that other fella. Hmm. Now, what happens? What makes marriage fail? Now, now, let me just give you a little James 4 before I hit the scriptures. That way I can get me out the way. Say, get me out the way. Amen. In 25 years of counseling, actually more than that, been counseling uh, almost from the uh, first year that I was a believer because God saved my marriage. And so my testimonies was counseling. <laughs> and so I've just written down some reasons that I've been able to glean from my counseling session uh, of 25 years of ministry in this church. Uh, let me just go through without comment, just like at the eight o'clock service. Well, without much comment. Uh, why? First of all, reason number one, mark this down. This reason is the number one reason because all the rest of them are just the fruit of this failure. Say, so what are you talking about? Not communing with Jesus. I'm going to show you a little later on. That is, if you don't have fellowship with Jesus, your marriage is in for a rough ride because the Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. Jesus has to be the cement, the foundation that you lay in your marriage. It can't be money, can't be education, can't be we, we got this, we're going to do this, our goals, our business, our houses, and all that kind of stuff. It just is not going to work. A house is not going to make you happy. Money is not going to give you meaning. A job is not going to give you joy. Only Jesus gives us that kind of stuff. Number two, number two, we've attained our goal. See, I got you. So why did I have to go through any effort? I got papers on you. Mm-hmm. See, we got to work as hard to keep them as we did to get them. As a matter of fact, I often say we have to work harder to keep them than we did to get them. And you know the things you went through to get who you sitting beside right now. Number three, we take off our mask. Folks always talk about, and, and I thought I knew him, but he, cha he ain't changed. He just took off his mask. You just seeing her for who she really is. Finally, and let me tell you something. Remember, I told you before, singles, when you're dating somebody, you're dating their representative. That's who they want you to see. But whenever you get married to them, they can take their, hair, their mask off. They can take their, let their hair down because now they got you. You're going to see who they really are. They ain't changed. Number four, we get tired of doing what we didn't, what we don't like. Now, we did it to get you. Okay, think about it. Think about you married now. You know, just think back. She don't like to go to this place. She don't like to go to that place, but she never said that before you got married. She always went there, but now you're going now, and all of a sudden you say, you say, yeah, let's go to Dusty's. I don't want to go to Dusty's. Well, where do you want to go? I want to go. I don't care where we go. You can pick it out. Well, I want to go to Dusty's. Well, I don't like Dusty's. We used to go to Dusty's all the time. Yeah, I didn't like Dusty's then either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that happens all the time, you know? You wonder why, wonder why your, your husband went shopping with you before and won't go shopping with you now. Because shopping is what people are going to do in hell. That's why you don't want to go. <laughs> Number five, reality sets in. We, we find out that love is enough to start a marriage, but it's not enough to keep a marriage. You say, well, we in love. That ain't going to pay your rent. We in love. That ain't going to settle no arguments. No, no, it ain't strong enough. What do I need? Commitment. Commitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like what Kenny used to say. Say we find out that his, that his breath stinks at 6 a.m. and his feet stinks at 6 p.m. <laughs> Reality check. You find out that she ain't sleeping beauty, she just lazy. <laughs> yeah, number six. Because now we're living together. When we were dating, we get mad. You go to your crib, I go to my crib. But now we're going to the same crib. And want to go to the same room. And get in the same bed. And it's supposed to be face to face. Now, I told him at 8 o'clock, I'm going to tell you too. See, I, 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 don't, I don't do out my house. I don't do other rooms. So if she get mad at me, she's going to have to deal with me in the bed with her 
back to back, not face to face, but back to back. But I ain't getting out of my bed. But Matthews, the only time I didn't sleep in my bed is when the one time in my whole marriage of 37 years, I hit Sister Ford and she said, you better not go to sleep. That's the only time I slept on the couch. <laughs> the only time I slept on the couch. That's it. I told y'all about that before. Every time I hear some movement upstairs, I jump up. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, yeah. Number seven, we want some things to change after we're married that we were cool with before we got married. You ain't never complained about that before. Now all of a sudden, you can't stand the fact that I'm watching my football. I always watch my football. As a matter of fact, you sat down beside me and watched the game. Asking me who was the star basketball player on the football team. <laughs> number eight, number eight. We haven't severed the strings. What are, you, what are you talking about? She hasn't severed daddy's purse strings. He hasn't severed mama's apron strings. You got to sever the strings. Yeah. Number nine. You used to do certain things before you were married that you stopped doing after you got married. Used to open the car door. Now she's lucky if you drive away before she get in. <laughs> you know those things you used to do? You used to try to show him you were Susie Homemaker. Uh, we, we know you was buying that stuff. You, you set it all out. Like the wife, the wife told her husband, her husband said, husband say, 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 you... you you haven't made me a hot breakfast in 10 years. She said, set your cornflakes on fire. Mm. Number 10, not as open to be corrected as you once were. Isn't it amazing how perfect we get after we get married? You could bring out some things, but then all of a sudden now, if you bring something out now, here you go again. Always rain on, hating on a brother. Mm -hmm. You never complained about what she said before you got married. Number 11, not meeting each other's basic needs. Number 12, expectations are too high. You're going into marriage and you got a frog. And you think you're going to get Prince Charming stuff from a frog. Listen. Can't do it. Whatever you got going in, don't expect anything more after. I know what you're saying. Oh, Lord, what? That's right. Then number 13, some things about marriage you just didn't know. Now, Samson gets married in Judges chapter 14. And his marriage fails for five reasons. First of all, a wrong criteria. Second of all, a weak commitment. That's as far as we'll get today. Third of all, a warped communication. Fourth of all, a whimsical conflict management style. And number five, a waning cash flow. Oh boy, was broke. And I don't care how much love you have, you don't get married broke. <laughs> I'm telling you. So let's look at this text. Let's walk through this text and let's look at these. Look, look what's going on in this, te this text. Now, Samson had a wrong criteria. Uh, a preacher was sharing with me. He said he was on the plane. And uh, while he was on the plane, he, he struck up a conversation to share the gospel. And when he shared the gospel, he noticed that the man he was talking to had his wedding band on the wrong finger. He said, he said, excuse me. He said, do you know you have your wedding band on the wrong finger? He said, it's not on the wrong finger. He said, yeah, 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 you wear your wedding band on this finger. You have it on this one. He said, I have it on the right finger because I married the wrong woman. Look at what it says in the text. It says, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. See what he's saying? Look what's going on in this text. Now, now you got to see what's going on here. Samson married the wrong person. I mean, I mean, let me just, I'm just going to tell you. Some of your marriages are bad because you married the wrong person. Now, when you say, I do, you're done. 
So it's too late now because you made a vow to God. But the reason you're going through it is because like Samson, you married the wrong. Now here's what gets me. You went and you married the wrong person, didn't use biblical criteria for evaluating who you were going to marry, and then turn around and get mad at Jesus because you're suffering with someone he never intended you to be with in the first place. You wanted him, you wanted her, and God, how many know that if you keep asking God for what he don't want you to have, he'll give it to you. Children of Israel, he gave them manna from on high. They wanted meat. So the Bible says he gave them meat till it ran out of their nostrils. And the meat turned out to be a curse till they got, I don't want any more meat. And some of you are saying right now that when you got down on your knees and begged for, oh God, give me John. Now you're saying, God, take him away. <laughs> Somebody's agreeing with me. <laughs> yeah, I got some help in here somewhere. Yeah. Now, 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 why? Because in the text it says that she's a Philistine. She's an enemy of God. Deuteronomy chapter 7, 1 through 3. Exodus 20, uh, 34, 12 through 16. Let me say it again. Exodus 34, 12 through 16. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 3 says don't have an unequal yoke. And here you have him hooking up with an unequal yoke. 2 Corinthians, beginning at, uh, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 18. Uh, how many single people know that verse by heart? How many single people we have in here? Lift your hands. Okay, y'all better learn that verse. You know what it says? Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, have light with darkness, have Christ with Belial, he's saying, listen, here's, here's the illustration he gives. He says the ox and the jackass won't plow together because the ox has a nature that's been changed and the ox will pull. In other words, the ox will go to church. The ox will tithe. The ox will serve. The ox will forgive. The ox will be willing to follow the Bible when the Bible shows the ox that the ox is wrong. But the jackass is stubborn. The jackass has an unchanged nature. The jackass wants to have his way. The jackass ass will not plow with an ox and the problem is some of y'all right now dating jackasses some of y'all right now married the jackasses can I tell you something get off the jackass find yourself an ox yoked yeah yoked to an oxen yeah, I better make sure I, you right, you right, Elder. Elder said, remind them, you got to be yoked to the ox first. Mm-hmm. But I married a believer, Pastor. Yeah, I married, a, I married a believer, dog. So, and did you know you can be unequally yoked with a believer? Oh, that's right. You can be unequally yoked with a believer. Yeah, because, because... Okay, let me just say this. Most Christians, when they find out somebody interested is saved, well, he saved, she saved, that's it. That's not where you end. That's where you start. That's the lowest qualification. Ain't no big deal because he's saved. There's a whole lot of saved brothers that are not trying to abide in Christ. They trying to abide in you. They ain't coming to church for Jesus. But I can't say what they're coming to church for. Mm. Now let me just, just clear the air. Because even if this woman was a Jew, she still shouldn't marry Samson and he a preacher. Let me tell you why. I know you want to know why, sister. You look at me like, why? Because he's still living with his mommy and his daddy. And one of the first principles of pillars is what? Therefore shall a man leave. Ask anybody. 25 years of marriage, 
I have never married anybody where the man didn't have a job, and I've never married anybody where they got to live with their mama. Yeah, yeah, we won't get married. We in love. So okay, so so where you work? Well, you know, right now. You know what I'm saying right now? I say, well, you know what I'm saying right now? Well, right now, we're going to have to wait. Why we got to wait? Till you get a job. Y'all know how I feel about it. I say it all the time. What is it called? sha na 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 theology. Get a job. sha na 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 Get a job. na 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 Get a job. Jib, 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 Get a job. That's right. That's right. Yeah, he, he a grown man living with his mama and got the nerve to be the judge, the governor, you know, the pastor living with his mama and his daddy. Mommy, daddy. You want a man like that? See, that's the problem now. Too many of y'all got them old wimpy lip wristed. You need yourself a real man. Because some of y'all some strong women. Now guess what? You may not like this. But if you're a strong woman, you need a stronger man. So why are you crying that the man is so strong? Because if he's strong and resolute, then you ain't got to worry about nobody walking up in your crib. You ain't got to worry about nobody doing that to your children. Because he's going to stand up and die for you. So you need to be strong about something. Well, he won't let me have my way. He ain't supposed to let you have your way all the time. He the head. Amen. Oh, let me, let me go on. Let me. Mm. My spiritual daughter is Katrina Conley. She's my spiritual daughter because out of all the young people, I got to get out of this thing, this thing, ha. Huh? Uh, out of all the young people uh, that grew up here, uh, she was one that stayed faithful and that stayed. That, that was a virgin when she got married. And I would check on her all the time. And I'd say, I'd say how things going, daughter? She'd say, things are going well. I'd say, who are you dating? I ain't dating nobody. i say, you ain't dating nobody? No, ain't nobody on the rise. Ain't nobody on the rise. So, okay, let me know when somebody is. And so, we, you know, we talk and she'd tell me, you know, well, so-and-so, he wanted to date me. And, you know, we went out and, uh, no, nah, he didn't meet the criteria. I said, what do you got? She had a list of 10 criteria. Now check this out. I said, I said, I said to her, it was a little bit before you left. I said, uh, I said, uh, anybody trying to step to you, girl? She said, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, one of your elders. I said, one of my elders? I said, yeah, I'm thinking, oh yeah, one of my elders? Hey, all right, an elder. Shoot, one of my elders, I picked them boys, man. They, you know, oh, I better not say that, huh? <laughs> so, so she said, I said, so what, what's coming of it? She said, nothing. I said, well, why? She said, because he didn't meet my criteria. I said, well, 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 don't tell me who it is, but what was wrong? She said, he has a child. And on my criteria, I'm a virgin. Now, he doesn't have to be a virgin, but he has to have no children. And so, and so I said, well, what did he say? He said, whenever he asked me out, I said, I said, no, I can't date you. He said, why? I love the Lord. She said, you do love the Lord. He said, but I mean, you know, all I want to do is just go out. We have some fun, you know, just explore a little bit. She said, I can't do that. He said, he said now, wait a minute now. He said, uh, well, what is it, my, my daughter? She said, yeah, yeah, you have a daughter. He said, well, that's in the past. I've been forgiven. You sure have. But I have a criteria. And my criteria is the person that I date, because I don't date the date I date to mate, that person will have to have no children. So then, so then she said, he said to me, but look, let's just go out to dinner. That ain't going to do no harm. To which she replied, yes, it will. Because if I go out to dinner with you and I start liking you, I will lower my standard. And I'm not going to lower my standard, so I'm not going to take a chance I can't go out with you. Man, now that, now that is, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that's not somebody who's like, oh, I'm just sitting here all by myself. I just want somebody, to, oh, you know, oh, Lord, send me somebody, please. Hmm. Let me say this. No woman gets what she expects. And no man expects what he gets. Okay, and you'll get that later on. Mm -hmm. teacher, teacher is saying to the child, say, give me a verse of scripture that governs marriage. And the little boy said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
Now, now, now let me just, and what I'm trying to do is I want to integrate my singles in here. I don't want to leave them out. Uh, 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 of course, you have to make sure you got a right criteria whenever you govern. You, do you got a list? Is it written down? Do you go down your list? Saved. Character. Let, let me just do this. In, in Genesis 24, 11 years ago, I preached the message entitled, Does Your Date Rate to Mate? Some of you were here for that. Not very many because that's 11 years ago. But uh, uh, I want to go through the principles real quick just for the singles. Mary, just hold up for a minute. In Genesis 24, it's just a powerful piece. And I'm just going to go through the principles, try to keep from commenting. In Genesis 24, here are the principles. There are five of them. The first principle is called the principle of commonality. You must have some things in common. Must we be alike? No. Must, must we have things in common? Yes. What things? In the text, three things. Must be converted, must be compatible in your personalities, must be consecrated to Jesus Christ. There, there's the three. Second principle is called the principle of Christ intervention. In verse 27, verse 39, I mean, verse 35, verse 39, verse 40, verse 42, verse 48, and verse 56, what do you have? You have Elimelech preparing, Elimelech praying. And what happens? It's a beautiful picture because it's a picture of Elimelech as the Holy Spirit, Abraham as God the Father, sending uh, the Holy Spirit to Rebekah, representing the church as a bride for Christ, represented by Isaac. So it's a beautiful picture. But what's going on there? Look at those verses and you will find he prayed and asked God to specifically direct him. He didn't know who the woman was, but he knew what the woman should be. And each time he was directed. Look at your neighbor, whether it's a male or female, this applies. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor. neighbor. Don't be a desperate housewife. housewife. Mm-hmm. That's right. Principle number three, the principle of character, the principle of character. Listen to this. Let me let me tell you something right now. You will attract who you are and not what you want. Now, let me say it again. I got to slow that down because some of y'all don't realize that you will attract who you are, not what you want. Let me go over here. You didn't hear me over here. I said you will attract who you are, not what you want. See, so then. What you have to do is this. You, you have to realize that you must become what you want in who you are. Hmm. In other words, let me say it another way. Make sure what you want is who you are. Hmm. It got quiet. It got quiet. Now, now let me just see if I can illustrate it. Recently, I, I, I bought a new vehicle. And it's an SUV. Now, before I had a regular car, and the wife had an SUV, we, we reversed that thing. But anyway, this SUV, I never noticed it before. Now, all of a sudden, I see it everywhere. Because I got one. You get the principle? When you go out there looking, you looking, not for what you want, but who you are. Now, whoever you got, that's who you are. You won't believe that. Evaluate it. The things you don't like in him, I bet you they in you. The things you don't like in her, I bet you they in you. I bet you. Because you know why? See, that's why a preacher got to be careful. A preacher always preaching against something, that's what he doing. Nine times out of ten, that's what he doing. That's, now, I ain't talking about just dealing with sin all over the place. But if every time, every time, every time, you on that a little bit too much, you know who you trying to convince, us or you? Hmm. That's right. That's right. And so then, she was internally disciplined, but she was eternally dedicated. Then principle number four, the principle of the clock, divine timetable. Some people say, you know what, my biological clock is running down. God can rewind it. He can rewind. He did it for Sarah. Sarah ain't had nothing that, sh that should have made her have a baby. Her womb was too old. Everything else was too old, sagging, lagging, dragging. She should not have been able... Okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. In other words, wait for God. 
Wait for God. Don't be in a hurry. Don't let the devil give you an Ishmael before God sends you your Isaac. Okay, let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. Finish this for me. He who finds a wife. My two elders right here finished it. Brother Vaughn finished it. And obtains favor from the Lord. That's the problem. Y'all done left off the end of the verse. Because the end of the verse tells us that you may be looking, but it's the Lord who directs you. And you get favor from him. That's why you're in such a mess, because you're doing it. You done left off the end of the verse. And finds a favor from the Lord. You don't know where to look for them. You don't know what they look like. You don't know where they are. But he does. Then the principle number five, the principle of confirmation. It was parental involvement in the marriages back then. And I know what you're saying. I want my mama, my daddy telling me who I'm supposed to marry, giving me their advice. You know that same survey? Seven out of ten couples married over ten years said they wish they would have listened to their mommy and their daddy when they said don't marry them. Now don't, don't, don't anybody move if you're married and your mate's here right now because we don't want you to give yourself away. <laughs> and isn't it ironic, Elder Green, that we don't want mommy and daddy's input, but it's the first ones we run to when we got trouble in our marriage. Yeah, it's like, it's like one, one baby girl called her that, Daddy, we had our first argument, and I want to come home. He says, sweetheart, you are home. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, number six, the principle of Christian destiny. The principle of Christian destiny. Say, what are you talking about? You got to realize that God did just not put you together so you could be happy in marriage. All right. Like, 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 like Pastor Neil, Sister Neil. See, when y'all got married, did you know that you were going to be a pastor? Did you know you were going to be a first lady? Get ready, girl. Get ready, get ready, get like, like T.D. Jake said, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You know, but I'm going to say what you really got to do is, is, is on the boxing. Let's get ready to rumble. Because you in for it, girl. I'm telling you right now. I'm just a, just an eye opener. You know, they say, they say, they say, they say love is a dream and marriage is the great eye opener. And, 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 and that's the way it is in the church. I'm telling you. So did you know that you were going to be used by God to proclaim the word of God, to establish a local assembly, to touch a whole community? Did you know that God was going to use you to nurture people and to lead people to Christ and to disciple them and to see marriages put back together and to see people taken from crack to Christ and, 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 and all that kind of stuff? Did you know that all that was going to happen when y'all got married? No. His, well, he said no. Wife said no. <laughs> no. But see, when God brought y'all together, he had that in mind. He had a destiny. That's why he picked you out for him because you're perfect for him. And so you come together and God says, you just wanted to be happy. I wanted you to be holy and helpful. Amen. That's right. Your marriage ain't for you. It's for God. He wants to use you. Uh, uh, well, well, anyway, let me, let me get back to Samson. So what happened to Samson? Two things then. He had an unequal yoke and he had an ungodly yearning. So the unequal yoke, he is a Philistine. She's an enemy of God. But he had an ungodly yearning. What, what, what he, he saw her and said, I want her to be my wife. He was a he-man with a she-weakness. <laughs> what was his first five words? Who remember one of the other sermons? What was his first five words? of the preacher. I have seen a woman. Boy, that's godly. That's his first five words. Man, man, uh, uh, Kenny Graham would say, the Bible says he smoked the Philistines hip and thigh. And then he turned around and said, and that's, that's how the women got Samson, hips and thighs. That's right. And so Samson could beat a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a jackass and every woman turned him into one. Now notice something, notice something. In verses 1 and 2, you know what you see? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He went down the Timnath, saw a woman, said, get her for me to wife. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Where's the pride of life, pastor? He asked his parents to do it when it's the job of the man to go to the father and do it. So notice the place. The place he goes is Timnath. Anybody know the etymology of the word Timnath in Hebrew? Here's what it means. Brother Bowen. And here's what it means. To hinder 
or to hold back. So he goes to a place of hindrance. Proverbs 12, 4 say a wife is to be a crown. And he's going down to somebody who's not going to be a compliment, but who's going to be in competition. Who's not going to be a helper, but who's going to be a hinderer. Who's not going to be a crown, who's going to be a cancer. Who's not going to be a nurturer, but verse 17 says she's a nagger. Yang, 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 yang. And the Bible says, the Bible says, and the Bible says that a nagging wife is like a dripping faucet. Ever get up in the middle of the night because your faucet's dripping? Drip, drip. Chip, 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 chip. It will drive you crazy. And you just want to pull your hair if you got any and say, ah! Shut up! Matter of fact, that's probably why some brothers ain't got no hair, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the point? If sex is bringing you to the altar, it's not enough to keep you there. See, being in lust and being in love is two different things. See, see, you can be in lust and not be in love. Sex can start a marriage, cause a marriage. It won't keep a marriage. See, lust, <laughs> lust, lust, lust can't wait. And I don't know how many of you know that love will wait. Because you can't hurry love. You, you just have to wait. Because it's a game of give and take. Mama said it. Uh, hey, can I speak to some of you single folks? You've been in a relationship and a relationship has broken up. Can I give you some, some principles to help you out? And let me help you out just real quick, just real quick. Uh, first of all, here's what you better do when you just broke up. I know your heart is broken. I know, brother, uh, it's like you feel like you've been dragged through the mud, kicked to the curb. I know, sister, you in pain. But listen, first thing you got to do is maintain your communion with Jesus Christ. Now, everything else is just like the other one. Everything else is just, just fluff and stuff. Secondly, you have to learn how to give the gift of goodbye. See, you wouldn't want to be a hasta la vista, baby. Number three, accept the fact that it's over. Some folk don't, Joe coming back, Sue coming back. Look to Jesus for your healing. They're the ones that hurt you. Fourthly, seek a mental separation. It begins in the mind. Renew your mind with what? The word of God. And number five, avoid unpleasant reminders. Quit calling their crib when you know they ain't home just so you can listen to their voice message. Quit riding by their house hoping that you'll see them in the lamplight. Get rid of that teddy bear. Tear that thing up. Quit smelling it. You know what you did? You put this cologne on there. Quit going to y'all's favorite restaurant. Find you another one. Number, number, whatever it is. Six, keep yourself busy. Keep yourself busy. And you know the best thing to do? Minister to somebody. Get involved in ministry. You just broke up? Get involved in ministry. I tell you what, you'll, you'll heal yourself quicker than you will doing anything else. Number seven, give your time, give yourself time to heal before you start dating again. You ain't healed yet. Taking all them scars and stuff. And, and I already told you, I, I'm sorry, I got to repeat it because some people ain't been here. And they, they never heard this. They first time business. I'm going to say it for them. Because what happens is you settle for what I call them. Come on, y'all. A paramedic man or a woman. What's a paramedic man or a woman? It's the person who fills the gap because you've just been hurt and they don't have the qualifications that you want. But because they're meeting a need that you have, you grab onto them to get some healing. But once you get healed, you look back and say, now what am I doing hooked up with that? I ain't never went with somebody who wore plaids and stripes. What in the world is, what in the world is wrong with me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, divorce folk too. You get divorced, you need, to, you need to have a couple years of just basking in communion with Jesus Christ. Number eight, be willing to suffer now to enjoy later. See the little pleasures that you're getting right now? You're going to pay the rest of your life for that? 
Number nine, focus on the benefits of being single. I find six in 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 40. Write that down, single folk. 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 40, six benefits from remaining single. I'm going to try to stick to my word here. Number 10, learn to appreciate yourself. Look, 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 look. Get your hair did for yourself. Get your nails did for yourself. Go buy yourself a new outfit for yourself. Take yourself and get your bubble bath with your candle, with your Luther, woo, 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 woo. You, you know, then get dressed. Look in the mirror and say, self, you got it going on. Yes, sir. Then get in your car or get on the bus. Take yourself to your favorite restaurant. Buy yourself your favorite food. Just have yourself a fun time with yourself. Because if you can't do that for yourself. I, I was telling with her 8 o'clock. Let's hear this real quick. Uh, my wife and my mother-in-law were, were in uh, Pittsburgh taking care of her father. And so I got a ritual when they're not here. On Sunday, after the second service, I go take me a shower, put on my street clothes, put on my, put on, put, put on my kango with my backwards, have my can kangaroo sitting on the top, go on out, and I go down to Red Lobster. So I go down to Red Lobster, and I, and I, get, myself a, I get myself a bowl, a bowl of the, uh, uh, the uh, seafood gumbo, and then I get myself two of those... Uh, 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 what do you call it, coleslaw, two coleslaw, and, and then I get me the, the lobster appetizers like crab rangoon, but it's lobster rangoon, you get those. Then I order me the admiral's platter with, with extra crab legs and an extra lobster. And a diet Pepsi. <laughs> diet Pepsi. So check it out. So I'm in there, I'm sitting down, I look across a cat a corner, I see a sister, she by herself. So you know how we are, we see a sister by herself, she ain't with nobody. You know, and I think it, I don't know, oh, she did it by herself, you know, I always think that kind of stuff. And so I'm looking over at her, and uh, she getting down. And I'm, I, she wasn't tit for tat with me, but man, old girl was, and she was, she was, she was, and so I kept looking, you know, and like, she, she's doing her stuff, and I was eating mine, and I said, dang. Yeah. And she's like, finally, finally, she did like this. She put her fork down, folded her arms and turned and looked at me, and then Satan just kept looking at me. And, 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 and you know, I was like getting sheep. I said, she may get up and slap me, you know. I, say, I, I went like this here and got my food and put my head down, started looking the other way. So afterward, I called my wife. I said, you know, I saw this young lady, and she was uh, by herself, and she was, she was putting it away. So I kept looking at her. Every time they brought something, they brought me something, they brought her something. And I kept looking at her because she wasn't near my big as I was. And I'm saying, man, I was sitting, my wife said, you know what she was doing? She was out just pampering herself. And she didn't want to be bothered by anybody. You kept looking over there. So finally, she's, she just, she didn't have to say anything like, you know what? What's your problem? What are you looking out? Yeah, I'm by myself. Yeah, I'm eating what I want. Yeah. Now you got something to say about that. All I can say is you go, girl. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen, Samson was where he should not have been. Where was he? Timnath, what's it mean? To hinder, to hold back. So he's in a place that's going to hold him back spiritually, sexually, emotionally, psychologically. Y'all better get out of Timnath. Come on, get out of Timnath. Or, or let me say it more appropriately, you better let Timnath go. That's her name. That's his name. If you're not further along, when you started the relationship, you're in Timnath. If that person's not adding to you, but they're always subtracting from you, you're in Timnath. Now, if you're not married, what is your problem? Mm -hmm. Now, he, he was where he should not have been, but exactly where he wanted to be. Say, what are you talking about, Pastor? See, he knew where to get what he wanted. He knew them Israeli girls ain't going for that that the girls in Timnath go for. Ah. 
In other words, he say, hey, hey, I can't go to Christ's Bible, but I know where I can go, where they're giving it up. Tim Nath. Now, I hope he can say he can't go to Christ's Bible. I'm already told y'all, the only thing worse than a hoochie is a what? Choochie. That's right. What's a choochie? Church hoochie. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. See, here's what Samson was saying. I can see it in my imagination. I'm going to have to take about 10 more minutes. Here's what Samson was saying. I can't go to the sanctuary, but I know I can get it at Secrets. I can't go to God's, but I can go to Geno's. I can't do it with the saints, but I can do it at the suites. I can't do it at the Bible church, but I can do it at the black cat. I can't do it uh, not, not with the praisers, but I can go to the premier. I can't do it at the Lord's, but I can do it at the legend. So this morning... One of my elders and his cohort hollered out, how you know? <laughs> Research. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ricky's, Wild Hair, Larista's. Now let me tell you what I did as I named them. You notice I looked up to see, because I wanted to see who was grinning like Cheshire cats. Because the folk does like, what's he talking about? They ain't been there. But the folks that say, y'all gave yourself away. I was, I was looking at my daughter because she smiled through all of them. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Yeah. In other words, he knew where to get what he wanted. Now, here's the problem. Desire determines decision. And decision determines destiny, and destiny, I mean, des uh, decision determines duty, and duty determines destiny. Listen, let me put it this way, and we're going to get on out of here. He made a permanent decision based on a superficial criteria. Say, what are you talking about? He saw. All he did was saw. Well, let me ask you something. You want to marry her? Then the text says, give me her to wife. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You want to marry her? You just saw her? Baby got back, hip, lip, fingertips, spandex, and you want to marry her? What's her name? Who's her daddy and her mom? She got any crazy people in her house, in her, in her family? Do they have a history of mental illness? Oh, how about any pedophiles? How about, I mean, you know, what kind of people are these people? A permanent decision based on a superficial criteria. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, look deep before you leap. Yeah, say this to your neighbor. Say this to your neighbor. Say, if you're going to fall in love, you better know who's catching you. That's right. As a matter of fact, Brother Green, I go one further. If you're going to fall in love, make sure whoever it is will catch you. Mm -hmm. He didn't know anything about her at all. He wasn't like Boaz. Remember Boaz? We studied him. Who did Boaz say? He didn't say like the, uh, like the Osley brother, who's that lady? Who's that? No, he said, whose damsel is this? Do you see that's a different question than what he is? I saw a woman get hurt me. Whose damsel? Who does she belong to? What's her family background? That's what he wanted to know. Because I'm going to tell you the nut don't fall too far from the tree. If her mama crazy, hello. If that daddy crazy, lazy, won't work, hello. Hello. Yeah, some brothers ain't looking for a wife. They looking for a mama. Mm. Samson's marriage failed because he married the wrong person for the wrong reason. Listen, you don't marry a woman, brother, just because she look good. You don't do it. You say, why? Those great theologians, they put it best. They said, you didn't hear me. I said, I said, those great theologians, they did it best. Y'all slow up there. Yo, yeah. 
warm as can be. And let me know that your love is here. You may not possess, but what I like. A pretty face, maybe. <laughs> yeah. They said, beauty's only skin deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only skin deep. And so, and so that's all you're getting. Listen, if you're going to marry him just because you have his baby, two wrongs don't make a right. Make sure you don't make a bigger mistake. And so what's happening? Sex is fooling folk. You say, what are you talking about, pastor? It's full. Here's, here's what I like to call it. Sex causes brain relocation. Now, did you understand what I was saying? That your brain moves from your head to another part of your anatomy. We commitment. Let's get out of here. We commitment. Oh, I went a little over. I'm going to go tell quarter two. You got to go. Got to go. And notice, secondly, a weak commitment. What, what, why did marriages fail? Why did Samson's marriage fail? Because he had a wrong criteria, then he had a weak commitment. Notice what it says. He, he was a man of faith, but he was not a faithful man. When you looked at it, he was controlled not by the Lord, but by his lust. In other words, when you look at what's going on here, his commitment to God was messed up. Now, how so? Let me give it to you real quick. Look at what it says in the text. It says... That Samson, verse 5, went down with his mother and father Timnath, came to a vineyard. Stop. Stop. Wait a minute. He's in Timnath with the Philistines in enemy territory with the enemies of God. He's hindered and he's with a pagan woman. Now it tells us he's in the vineyard. Then what does he do in verse 6? In verse 6, he kills a lion and when he comes back, there's honey in the lion and he reaches into the lion to kill things. Now, how do we know this brother is in trouble? Because he's a Nazarite. Now, in the Nazarites, they take a vow that has three elements. Later on, he's going to get his hair cut in the devil's barbershop. He, he should have went to keep your head up. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that's my son's barbershop on 87th Street. <laughs> so he's going to get his hair cut. Nazarite should never cut their hair. But what's he doing now that shows us he's not committed to God? He went into a vineyard. What's in a vineyard? Grapes. What comes from grapes? Wine. What's the second thing a Nazarite is not supposed to do? Mess with wine. Then a Nazarite is not supposed to touch a dead thing. So what does he do? He reaches into the dead thing. Now, wait a minute. Get this now. He reaches into the dead thing to find the sweet stuff. Went into a dead place to find sweet stuff. So as Warren Wisby would say, he was not stung by the bees, he was stung by the honey. Yeah. Now if you can't say amen, you, you, you know you've been there, just say ouch. Just say ouch. Yeah. And so listen, 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 listen. You're hooking up with somebody. Say, what are you talking about? And uh, you, you evaluate them. And I had this happen in one of my counseling sessions where he came in and, you know, we're talking. He had been, he had been married before and now it's his second marriage and blah, 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 blah. And, and I said, uh, so are you paying child support? He said, oh, no, I'm not paying child support. You know, and I said, well, then if he's not paying her child support, he'll do the same thing to you and not pay you child support. And he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? We came to you for counseling. I said, that's what I'm giving you. <laughs> you they're your children. You should take care of your children. You, they're your children. Even if you don't want anything to do with her, they're your children. So anyway, hmm. here's, here's the problem. Let me cut to the quick. If he won't change for God, he sure enough ain't going to change for you. If she won't change for God, she sure enough ain't going to change for you. Yeah, yeah. He goes down and, and he's missionary dating. That's what he's doing. He's dating someone Jesus would send him to minister to. And so it's like that. The grace of God has become license. Let me just say it this way so I can get you on out of here. Your commitment to your spouse is an indication of your relationship with Jesus. 
If you're not rightly related to your wife, you are not rightly related to Jesus. If you're not rightly related to your husband, you're not rightly related to Jesus. I'm telling you, that's just it. Uh, you know, and, and Brother Leroy said it wasn't them. And, and, and I did it before, but I want to do it now real quick. I'm going to use the Neils real quick. Come on, Neils. Sister Neil, you stand over there. Brother Neil, you come on, run down here. You athletic. You go to club every day. You can make that run. Amen. Now, let me show you. Let me show you. Now, here's what happened. Look at her like you don't like her. I know it's going to be hard, but look at her. Look at her like you don't. Look at him like you don't like him. Okay, y'all got something going on. Now, this animosity, this space represents the stuff that's between them. Now, here's what we do that's wrong. We focus on each other when we should be focusing on the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to show you. Everything that's between them will be dealt with if they will focus on the light because Jesus promised that he would do it. So then what I want you to do is not look at your husband, but slowly walk toward the light. I want you not to look at her, but slowly walk toward the light. Come on. Keep your eyes on the light. Don't look at each other. Just keep your eyes on the light. When you get under the light, stop. Keep your eyes on the light. When you get under the light, stop. Now look down and see who's with you. That's the way it works, people. Thank you very much, Pastor and Sister Neil. That's the way it works. I'm telling you, that's the way it works. So what was wrong with her? Her weak commitment, her commitment was more to other men than it was to her own husband. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have you called us to take us to take that which we have? It is not so, she says. So what's going on there? She has more commitment to her daddy and to those men than to her own husband. And I want to tell you something. You are not ready to get married if he's not going to be the number one man in your life. And you are not ready to get married if she's not going to be the number one woman in your life. I don't care how many wives you've had, girlfriends, baby daddy, baby mama drama, all that. I don't care. If she's not number one, if he's not number one, your commitment is too weak. If there's anybody that can come between you, Amen. your commitment is too weak. Amen. It's too weak. It's too weak. It's too weak. Now, you can write it down, but in 2 Samuel chapter 6, here's what you find. 2 Samuel chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 11. It says, and Michal, Saul's daughter. Michal, Saul's daughter. Michal, Saul's daughter. Three times he calls her Saul's daughter. Well, wait a minute. I don't get it. That's David's wife. Now, why in the world in 2 Samuel 19, 11, does it say... Michael, David's wife. Then later on, Saul's daughter. Let me tell you why. Because from, the, from 19 to 2nd, uh, 1 Samuel 19 to 2 Samuel uh, 6, something happened. Her commitment to David fell off. Now it calls her Saul, um, Michael, Saul's daughter, for one of two reasons. Number one, she just like her daddy. Or number two, her commitment to her father is greater than her commitment to her husband. Now listen, I'm going to close. And, I, I, and I'm telling you, this is not an effort at anybody's personal aggrandizement. This is not, I'm, I'm, all I'm telling you is, I'm telling you what's happened based on my commitment and my wife's commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that you could be committed. And I tease all the time and say, you know, I'm so committed to my wife that if she ever leave me, I'm going with her. Y'all know, y'all know I say that all the time. But you don't think I mean it. You think I'm joking, but I do mean it. And I want to tell you that if you put Jesus first, I want to tell you what, what our marriage has survived. 37 years of marriage. We were together eight years, so that's 45 years with this woman. And in 45 years, she has had infidelity. I have had infidelities, but yet God gave us a commitment that was greater than infidelity, which is one of the greatest damages you could do to a marriage. We've lost two children. We've had two babies die in infancy and we survived that because the commitment that we had to Jesus was big enough and bigger than what our problem was. We have had a son who was born edgily mentally handicapped and anybody has a handicapped child, he lived for 24 years and it's, a, it's an adjustment that unless you have a handicapped child, you have no idea what it's all about. But we survived that because we had a greater commitment to Jesus Christ. He died at 24 and we survived that because we had a greater commitment to Jesus Christ. My wife now has been sick 
for 18 years. The average stay in the hospital is three times a year. And so I do in this 18 years, most of the cooking, most of the cleaning, most of everything. And our marriage has survived because of our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. My marriage has survived being a pastor of a church. You don't know what our family has gone through. You'll find out. But it's, it, you, it's like no other thing. Sometimes my, it, it just, my, my children were ruined in here. My wife was ruined in here. I mean, when we first came here, not y'all folk, we first came here, they put us through all kind of hell. They robbed us, had me, had me $100 a week with a family of five in 1986. And here my wife was, left all this comfort to come and live in poverty, lower than the poverty level for a family of five. But we survived because of our commitment to Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, you can survive too. Now we're going into another phase because we're taking care of her mother. And her mother's in the beginning stages of Alzheimer. And I, you know, it's not going to be a picnic. The ride's getting rougher and rougher. But you know what? We will survive. You want to know why? Because we're committed to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gives us power to do what we... Have you ever wanted to leave? Yeah. Have you, has she ever wanted to leave? Yeah. Have you ever wanted to say, let me find somebody who don't have problems? Yeah. Has she ever wanted to say, yes, yes. Have you ever said this pain of losing children with you is too? Yes, yes. Well, why haven't you gone anywhere? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's why. That's the only reason. I'm no different from any of you. That's the only reason. Because he gives me the power to do what he wants done. Now, if he can do it for me, he's no respect the person. So don't you tell me, well, we just couldn't get it on. Because I don't want to hear it. Now, the only question on the floor is this. Come on, elders. Will you come to the light? Now, you heard the elders say it. You don't got to leave your seat. If you, believe, if you came in here and you did not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, who died, was buried, and rose again the third day, you became a believer right where you were sitting. Then why have us walk the aisle? Because we want to get your name. We want to take you through the scriptures. See, I know you won't believe this. In, in churches all over this land, there are people who come every Sunday who don't even know what the gospel is. 